Yeah, yeah, I know I'm late to this, except not really because I'm about to talk about everything that other people haven't milked this game for. Five Nights at Freddy's Help Wanted 2 has provided us with a lot in terms of lore to chew on, but more than that, it's also just a really well put together game. It's just so much fun. It, it, there's just something that feels good about impaling. This is awesome, and I am terrified. Uh. Yeah! The war's over there, what are you? <laughs> Here's the thing though, I have a problem in the midst of all this. And that problem... is seasonal depression. You see, I have a hyperfixation on this franchise from my teenage youth, and thinking about it helps me cope. Like and retweet if the 2010s also f*** you up. And naturally, I've been thinking a lot about what's happened in the past year, and where things are going, and I know all of you have as well. Which is why even though this is my first video on Help Wanted 2, I won't be covering things that the community has already sort of settled on. Besides, I know why you're really here. You're here for the niche. The obscure. The I'm up at 3am and I have an obsession with the funny bear man so let's talk about it kind of lore. I can officially say it, I'm looking forward to the future of FNAF's story. Scott and Steel Wool are taking things in an exciting new direction that I think is calling back to the Bite of 83, and weirdest of all, FNAF World. Yeah, that weird RPG Scott Cawthon regretted making? I think it's now becoming the focal point for the series' future. Yes, I'm serious. Yes, it's cursed. Let me explain. First off, the stuff we've settled on. For the sake of making this video more focused, I'll be assuming that our protagonist is Cassie's dad. There's a lot of evidence for this already between the Faz Wrench being familiar, and the references to Bonnie being his favorite character, as well as having access to the Foxy Log ride that Cassie wrote, despite it never being open. He is the character that I have most unanimously seen the community accept as the player character in this game, so we're gonna roll with it. Alright, let's get to the juicy stuff. First question I had after playing this game was, the hell is even happening anymore? So the game follows Cassie's dad as he performs various tasks throughout the Pizza Plex, both in the real world and in the AR network. When we play enough minigames that we receive the Faz Wrench as a prize, Mr. Kepo tells us to use the key to confront the darkness. The key is familiar to you. Congrats to Mr. Kippo, by the way, I'm so proud of the glow up. So after using the key to access the back rooms, we see a poster for employees showing a worker wearing the Vanny mask, which says, clocking out already? Take off your mask. Notably, this seems to tell us that these Vanny masks are used by any and all human employees of the Pizza Plex, which could have some implications for what Vanny says in Hope Wonder 1's DLC about her making the mask, but I'm gonna choose to keep some of my sanity and not talk about her too much in this video. In here, we also find an AR inhibitor and the Princess Quest 4 arcade cabinet. These AR inhibitors were placed throughout the Pizza Plex in Ruin and would prevent Cassie from putting the mask on in that game, but here it's preventing us from taking it off. Disabling the inhibitor and taking off our mask shows that we're in the real Pizza Plex, after it's been destroyed by the earthquake. What? This reveal tells us a lot about the AR network, and it actually lines up with Fazbear Entertainment's plans for the Pizzaplex in general. The stories in the Tales from the Pizzaplex books almost all involve some sort of VR or AR attraction that leads to the protagonist characters either going insane or dying horrifically in seemingly supernatural ways. They're not actually supernatural, it's just really advanced tech functioning not as intended. But I want to call out the epilogues especially, because they actually tell us that Fazbear Entertainment originally had plans to restore the old underground pizzeria to be a museum, basically showcasing the franchise's history. Rumors had spread about this to the point that the teenage characters in these epilogues actually already knew about the pizzeria before the Pizzaplex was done being built. Before they all proceed to go down and get trapped with the mimic, and then the slaughter fest happens. It's actually really gruesome. When I first played the game, I thought that's what had happened, that they remodeled the underground pizzeria. But the mask reveal makes it obvious that although they didn't physically remodel it, with AR tech, they still had plans to turn the whole place into an attraction for cheap. That description on the PlayStation Store was accurate. We are the only human employee left in the Pizzaplex. But okay, there's an elephant in this room, right? A very circus-themed elephant. No, not you. We'll get to you later. Why all the sister location in FNAF 6 stuff? Go figure. I have a theory about it. We can make a solid, estimated guess with what we know about Fazbear Entertainment at this point. It seems clear that we're not actually interacting with these characters in the real world. Otherwise, we would actually be interacting with Circus Baby in the Sister Location private room, which doesn't make any sense. By this point in the game, she is scooped and merged and separated and refurbished and burned and dead years before the Pizza Box even opened. Instead, these minigames serve as training material for new employees. The description for the game touts us as a brand new employee of Fazbear Entertainment. 
and upon starting the game for the first time, we're treated to this introduction. Fazbear Entertainment is offering a new on-the-job training position for a future pizza professional. It's common practice in many industries now to train new employees with a combination of real on-the-job experience and simulated material like videos and tests. But companies have been utilizing that second one a lot more lately. VR, especially in the medical industry, has become popular for this due to the level of immersion it allows without any risk of messing things up in a real scenario. You know, like accidentally killing a patient. The Vinny Mask seems to be helping Cassie's dad do just that. Illusionary technology is being used to create fake scenarios that will improve the relevant skills needed for our job, like repairing attractions while guests are around, or applying first aid to pizzeria customers. But again, that begs a question. Why include characters like Lefty and Scrap Baby, or Ennard even, into the training regimen? Well, we were actually given the technical answer to this before but I believe it's because Fazbear employees will need to be familiar with all Fazbear intellectual property. Remember when Help Wanted 1 came out? All the way back in 2019, we got a collection of game modes from the old FNAF games for playing in virtual reality. Except it wasn't just a collection of old stuff, it was a canon entry into the franchise. We were told that the old games we played were just fabrications, and what we're playing through is a compilation of those indie games that were made. We have recreated many of these completely fictitious scenarios, lies, that you've been fed over the last several years into a hilarious VR game. This should all be familiar if you've been watching my channel, as I've used this for evidence before, but stick around, I promise it's relevant to today. Canonically in Help Wanted 1, our protagonist is testing the Freddy Fazbear Virtual Experience, a compilation of the indie games that are a cover-up for actual tragedies. Vague? Yes. Very much on purpose, since the books describe the indie developer as completely unaware of what actually happens at Freddy's in this universe. It's also why I'm forced to recount this story every time I bring up Help Wanted 1, because no one bothers to actually read these damn things, and not just take the two-sentence summaries at face value. Playing through Help Wanted 1, we see these indie games are the literal FNAF 1, 2, and 3, as they are listed by name, and their gameplay is extremely accurate to the real games that exist. Even FNAF 4 is pretty much here in everything but name. Help Wanted 2 is showing us this same thing is happening again, where Sister Location and FNAF 6 and its characters are fictitious properties owned by Fazbear Entertainment. Fazbear Entertainment literally owns these games, hence why Sister Location is listed by name on the computer in the hub. Then, even in the Tales from the Pizza Flex books, we have even more examples of this. In the Monty Within, we're told that Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Sim is a game that was made in-universe, and that's where characters like Orville Elephant comes from. If this is sounding familiar, it's because yeah, I am back on this train of thought. My first ever FNAF Theory video talked about similar stuff, and I believe Help Wanted 2 is even more evidence for that theory, so if you haven't seen it and would like the full explanation, I've put the link to the video on the top right over here. Over here? Over, over here? I talk about things like the indie developer more in depth over there. I'll still go over the main points succinctly here, and if you like it, you should subscribe so I can continue cursing the public with knowledge about my obsessions. More examples of these in-universe games can be seen with how the different animatronics are presented in this game, but even more so than that, the books just lay it all out in, like, plain English. For example, in a story called Pressure, the main character Luca is taking part in a role-playing attraction in the Pizzaplex, in which you're able to wear costumes based on various Fazbear characters. Welcome to Freddy Fazbear's Mega Pizzaplex, where you can live out your dreams of being a real furry. Luca eventually sees two kids arguing over a Golden Freddy costume. Straight up, that isn't me paraphrasing, they mention Golden Freddy by name as a Fazbear Entertainment character. That's not even to mention that the entire story is based around how Luca has to later wear a Springtrap costume while he and his friends play out a scenario based on Five Nights at Freddy's 3. All of these events that happen in these old games now exist as publicly available video games in this universe. Everyone here knows about them, including characters like Gregory, Vanny, Cassie's dad. These characters would canonically be aware of the actions of Michael Afton and Henry. It's weird to think about, right? And I've seen a lot of people say that the actual tragedies these stories originated from must have been the same as what we see in FNAF 1 through 6. But with what we know about how they were made, that can't be the case. Remember what I said about the indie developer? Reading through this story, he doesn't come across as a parallel for anyone who would know about the real events. He is an unreliable source of information for what really happened in this universe, and therefore, so are these games. Think about it, we're seeing characters that no one in this universe should know about. Ennard, great example. Michael Afton should be the only person who would know about the existence of Ennard. The only one. The Fun Times coalesced together specifically for his arrival so that they could use his body to hide inside of and escape. And then later, when they get ejected, they have no disguise, no mask. And so they escaped directly into the sewers away from anyone else. No one in this universe would know about Ennard, even as a concept, let alone with this mask. Nobody except Michael. 
Same goes for Scrap Baby, who only exists because of Ennard. Sure, Henry would also know about these characters, but both Michael and Henry should be dead by this point. And neither man are characterized as wanting Fazbear Entertainment to still be around. Their sacrifice in FNAF 6 makes that very clear. So why do we have these characters being recreated? In the case of Ennard, his gameplay in the private room is identical to Sister Location. Wait, the private room? The room which was only a part of the fake ending of Sister Location? Yeah, some people forget this, but Michael canonically does not go into the private room during his time at Circus Baby's Entertainment and Rentals. The real ending of that game shows him entering the scooping room and being scooped, but the fake ending, specified at the bottom left of the credits, is saved for the private room gameplay, in which the FNAF 4 1983 Easter egg is found, and Ender dons the circus clown mask to hunt down Michael for his skin. All of this canonically does not happen to Michael, but this exact gameplay, the private room and custom night appear here as real training regimen for Fazbear Entertainment employees. We can even enter 1983 on the keypad to get a key to progress the story. It's extremely detailed, but how could Fazbear Entertainment know about any of this? No one would know about those events, right? It doesn't make sense unless the games in-universe aren't accurate to reality. That Fazbear Entertainment was right, that this all actually was a fabrication. At best, an exaggeration of what really happened. Alright, just follow me here. Let's think of the FNAF timeline like a series of... Matryoshka dolls? Oh god, the fact that I have to say that is really telling. Uh, look, we'll just use bubbles. I promise I'm not crazy. I just failed art class, okay? In this bubble is the original series of games, the ones that we played, but surrounding it is a bigger bubble. This is where Help Wanted 1, Security Breach, and Help Wanted 2 exist. Everyone here knows about the old characters and events because they're all Fazbear Entertainment IP, now being recreated in virtual reality for everything from games to training programs. Everyone in this greater universe knows who Golden Freddy is, who Springtrap is, who Ennard is, and even who Michael and the Crying Child are. Whether or not those characters actually existed in reality. If this is actually the world that Scott and Steelwool are working with, it solves a lot of things that just felt wrong about the modern lore, because we've been assuming the wrong things. An opinion held by about half of the FNAF community is that the books and games are separate continuities, with similar but different events. The other half say that the books line up too closely to Security Breach and Help Wanted to not be in the same universe, and they should be treated as all the same story. But I think we're looking at it the wrong way. I think the first Scott-made games are their own version of events contained within these indie games, and the Steel Wool games and the novella series are, together, their own greater universe with their own version of events. A big argument in the community against including the books in the same continuity as the games is an abundance of small inconsistencies with the original game's events. This mostly goes for the Fazbear Fright series, but it applies to Tales as well. For example, a character named Edwin is touted as being the creator of the Freddy's animatronics, but under this interpretation, Henry may not even exist in reality. Henry may have been a name used by the games to represent the likeness of Edwin Murray, the real creator. This would explain so much of the weird inconsistencies that have been going on within the games themselves. It would explain why this pizza place doesn't look burned down at all, because in this universe, that's not really what happened. It would explain why Fazbear Entertainment's no longer a corporate entity at the end of FNAF 6, but is back in full stride here. It could also explain the weirdness of the Tangle. That is this universe's equivalent of Molten Freddy. Or more accurately, Molten Freddy is the developer's interpretation of how the Tangle could have come to be. It would even explain the appearance of the Scooper at the end of Ruin. Yeah, remember that? That thing still makes no sense. It doesn't make sense unless that is this universe's scooper, and this is this universe's scooping room. Just because Sister Location The Game showcased a man getting his inside scooped out doesn't necessarily mean that this is exactly how that happened. It could have looked more like this. In the same way that even though some version of FNAF 6's events happened, as indicated by the existence of the pizzeria underneath the pizzaplex, doesn't mean Henry is the one who built it. This could have been Edwin, who ended up actually surviving as we see in the books. In this scenario, the real William Afton may have never even had those two sons and Elizabeth. Instead, maybe that employee listing from FNAF AR was right, and the real Afton had one daughter named Vanessa. The truth is, a lot of the events that we assume to have happened in this universe have been told to us through unreliable sources, either as games from developers who don't know the full truth, or as augmented reality distortions. But why does this matter in Help Wanted 2, right? I just spent the past three pages of this script describing probably the craziest conspiracy theory you've ever heard about in this franchise, so what's the point, right? Well, for one, there's actually way crazier stuff that comes from this franchise. Have you ever heard of the Springtrap Mpreg story? That's not even a theory. That's that's canon to this franchise. Not even MatPat can help you there. But secondly, I bring all this up because we're seeing yet another example of how video games are affecting real-world characters. And it's all because of Princess Quest and FNAF World. 
My original video went into detail about how I believe Vanny has been manipulated by the Mimics AI to recreate the in-universe games events. From reconstructing Help Wanted's minigames in real life, to recreating the video game's version of the Afton family, all while fulfilling the role of the rabbit suit murderer from the games. But there's one thing I failed to cover in that video, and that was anything about Princess Quest. I have to cover it now because, I mean, come on, I never expected that I would actually get to slay, girl. Evidence from Ruin heavily suggested that the canon ending of Security Breach follows Gregory playing and beating all three Princess Quest arcade cabinets, resulting in Vanessa being freed. Which is super weird, right? How does beating an arcade cabinet free Vanessa's mind? Well, we have another few examples of exactly this happening elsewhere in the franchise, which comes in the form of Happiest Day and FNAF World finally talking about the topic of the video. I've made the mistake of calling it non-canon before, but I've since learned that it was never actually deemed non-canon. Instead, Scott just regretted making it, but people pointed out to me that technically this game is a canonical entry in the franchise, which... I mean, how the f*** does that work? This is a game where you are in animatronica, and you fight squids, and plants, and purple geist, and a sassy rainbow, and a representation of the creator of the game himself. This game has references to The Bite of 83, and seemed to be setting up the minigames in FNAF 3 to play Happiest Day, two of the most important scenes in these games, and it happens in the same game where Fredbear says do a barrel roll. Do a barrel roll! There has been no explanation for what relevance FNAF World had, or for that matter, how you could dial a code in the office wall of FNAF 3 to play an arcade game that freed literal children's souls. The best we could do was guess that it was all a metaphor for something, I don't know, love and compassion, I guess? But we're seeing here, now, that Vanny and Glitchtrap have direct ties to this fake video gamey world in Princess Quest, that Cassie's dad gets to traverse through himself, to the point that it has a real impact on all of these characters. And in the context that Five Nights at Freddy's 3 is a literal video game in this universe, this all actually makes every bit of sense. All of this, battles and codes and arcades, are video game mechanics, yes. But these video game mechanics, when combined with this power of programs replacing human and free will have real consequences. Now do I think that FNAF Worlds is a video game in universe connected to a real child soul who we end up freeing? One we probably haven't seen yet? Well, the possibility is there, especially when there are things like random glitches, and a Fredbear that talks to you directly like you need to solve the Da Vinci Code. FNAF World is a game that is very explicit in breaking the fourth wall. It literally opens up and you hear fans whirring in the background like you just booted up an old DOS program. And I think that's what Scott originally intended for it. That we, the player, are helping these souls, these ghosts in the machine, get freed by playing a video game. Hence why his explanation for whether the good or bad ending of FNAF 3 was The answer is complex. Now, in the context that the FNAF games are surrounded by a wider universe, he can fully realize this idea using fake characters like Vanny, Gregory, and Cassie's dad, rather than relying on us to realize that we were a part of the mystery this whole time. I think that's also what Deskman in FNAF World has been recontextualized to be. Up until now, with the context we were given, we reasonably assumed that this was either Henry or William, not a canon appearance, but something more metaphorical. He appears out of nowhere to say that he is the one who built Circus Baby, after all. Separate from Scott himself, who appears as a final boss with the different avatar and personality entirely. But with the possibility of FNAF World being a video game in-universe, there's an opportunity for Deskman to be a new character that matters. The avatar of a brand new game developer for Fazbear Entertainment. The one to make the Sister Location and Pizzeria Simulator games. And maybe even Ultimate Custom Night given its references to FNAF World. He designed Circus Baby, the video game character, and he regrets it because he knows that he made games and fictional stories that mocked the deaths of potentially real people. But okay, I will admit that a lot of this was side tangents. Let's bring things back to reality a bit, because our main characters in Help Wanted 2 are still having a bad time. What does FNAF World have to do with them? Now, Glitchtrap has a lot going on. He was a program uploaded into the Freddy Fazbear Virtual Experience, was trained to mimic the indie games, and eventually manifested inside of Vanny. All that's clear, yeah? The fact that his voice lines are mimicking Tape Girl seems to point to this. Yep, that's as clear as the bottle of vodka I'm gonna need to get through this. Now what happens when we take this knowledge and apply it to Help Wanted 2, knowing that the same program is messing with us here? Cassie's dad is a character that seemingly doesn't have all of his memories together. Or is that just what Glitchtrap is telling him? At multiple points, we're offered poppets representing the original missing children's incident kids. The achievement for collecting your first doll is called Remember Jeremy? Yes. Yes, I do. Unfortunately, more than I want to have to. The description specifies that you obtain the achievement for collecting a quote-unquote memory, meaning that these dolls are memories related to one of our potential Jeremy candidates, being offered by a hand that looks suspiciously like Glitchtrap's. This isn't even me being coy, it's actually Glitchtrap's model. These memories have bothered me for a long time. There's just something not right about this whole situation. 
Why is Glitchtrap offering these memories to us? For what purpose? Are we actually Jeremy? Is it to remind us of who we are? Why would Glitchtrap want to do that? There's no motivation for Glitchtrap to have us regain our memories, unless they aren't our memories to begin with. Remember that Glitchtrap, at its core, is a program. One that infected a compilation of Five Nights at Freddy's games and has been mimicking whatever it encounters. First a yellow rabbit, then a white bear inside of the AR mask. A mimic AI that has already infected someone's brain, causing her to believe that she is a person that she isn't. Now, I want to read an excerpt from Nexi, The Sixth Tales book. This story takes place immediately after the mimic virus is uploaded into the Pizzaplex network for the first time. It's literally happening immediately after, since the place is open and all the machinery starts to go haywire around the storyteller tree, forcing them to close the place early. A little girl named Astrid gets an animatronic doll at the Pizzaplex, which is clearly infected with a malicious AI because by the end of the story it kills her, but that's not important. What I want to focus on happens immediately after she obtains it. Your name means beautiful, Nexi said. Everyone should match their name. Astrid couldn't believe Nexi said things like that. In just the one day Astrid had been with Nexi, Astrid had learned that Nexi was almost like a real person. She was way more advanced than the other Buddytronics Astrid had seen. Nexi in this story is clearly a branch of the Mimic AI that infected the Pizzaplex, finding its way into the doll. Throughout this whole story, what does it do but try its hardest to ensure that Astrid matches her name, which means beautiful. Now, I want to make something very clear right now. I believe wholeheartedly that Cassie's dad is named Jeremy, the same one that got his face sliced off in Help Wanted 1. There was something that looked like a Halloween mask laying on the floor. I heard a shuffle from the testing room and realized Jeremy must be there. I couldn't see his face. He had the visor covering his head. He had ink spilled on himself as well. Jeremy has come back, and that's why the achievement is titled Remember Jeremy. Notice the change in grammar between Help Wanted 1 and 2. It's posed as a question instead of a statement. A question aimed at Jeremy. I actually have Anton to thank for that detail. Go check out his video, I'll put it in the description. But then how does that all relate to the final biggest easter egg of this game? At the end of Princess Quest 4, there's an easter egg you can obtain for lighting all of the gravestones based on the number of dots they have. This pattern unlocks a hole in the ground, almost like a mausoleum with six dots surrounding leading to a chest that contains a bonnie mask. This looks familiar. This looks familiar. Does it? How would you not know, Jeremy? After all, it was only the most impactful moment of your life. This mask, there's no question. It has to be referring to 1983. Here's the problem, though. Doesn't that mean that the Bite of 83 still had to have happened just like we see in FNAF 4? Despite it being a video game, this mask implies that Jeremy is this guy, and that he put a kid in Fredbear's mouth, doesn't it? No, actually, I know I built up that dramatic reveal, but it's because I have a counter-argument to this theory. This looks familiar. It's very particular language, isn't it? Looks, not feels or seems. It looks familiar. I think there was a tragic accident in 1983. I think that is true, but I don't think this was literally it. I think that's just what Glitchtrap wants our character to believe. All right, final stretch, you ready? This is a long time coming, I wanna make it worth it. See, in addition to all of the emphasis on our character having to remember who he is, alongside it all has been a lot of imagery of Fallfest, clearly hinting at a future game or project from the developers. The Carousel minigame and Phaser Blast both seem to be set at this location we've never seen before. We're also given a poster that shows Fallfest was established as early as 1970, but these also aren't the first hints we've had about this festival. In Help Wanted 1, we're shown imagery of Fallfest 1983 specifically. This is a seed that's been planted in the story for some time now, and we still have no indication of what it's actually supposed to tell us, for a project that we haven't even seen yet. If our Jeremy is supposed to be haunted by memories of the Bite of 83 specifically, then why are we given so much imagery of this Fall Fest instead? Shouldn't we be seeing imagery of Fred Bears? Well, what if Fall Fest is being shown to us now in order to tell us that this is Jeremy's origin? That this is where this extended universe's version of the Bite of 83 occurs? A tragic event that kicks off the history of horror for Fazbear Entertainment, just like what the Bite of 83 is said to have done for Fred Bears and Henry. It would make sense why there's such an emphasis on the place burning down. That's the event or bully's cause that sets off years of torment for their families. Glitchtrap has been using the trauma of this real event to change Jeremy's memories, to line up closer with the Jeremys in the games. Why would Glitchtrap want Jeremy to slice his face off? Why would he want us to collect memories? 
Why would he want us to follow these dolls and prove that we know the correct pill order to obtain this mask? It's for the same reason that he turned Vanessa into a killer in a bunny costume. For the same reason this Mimic AI is recreating families and tragedies, and it's because Glitchtrap needs Jeremy to fulfill his role. He needs Jeremy to be what he was meant to be, the Bonnie Boy, Michael's friend, Jeremy Fitzgerald, the head injury victim. And if you need more proof of Jeremy being this guy's name, look no further than the FNAF movie, where a character named Jeremiah is cast to be Michael's friend. Just like in the games that the Mimic AI was trained on. The AI that is impressing these memories onto Cassie's dad, manipulating him through his own trauma to further fit his role as a character from a fictional universe. The game got inside of his head, and now he can't tell reality from fiction. And I don't think it's going to stop with Jeremy. As of right now, we know of two new FNAF games coming soon. The first was already announced, a game based on the Into the Pit book, but the second is actually really interesting. Click Team, the team behind the engine that Scott built the original FNAF games on, has been teasing a new FNAF project for some time now. It started with this render of LolBit on their Twitter, which seems to imply some sort of sequel to FNAF World. LolBit was a shopkeeper in that game, similar to how they're standing in this render in front of what appears to be a prize counter. And what are we treated to in the credits of Help Wanted 2? A rendition of FNAF World's ambient music. clever hint that the future of the franchise lies beyond the fourth wall. In addition to that though, Click Team has another teaser for this project. On their website, you can go to their FNAF page and find advertisements for the movie, as well as all the Click Team based games. But on the bottom right corner of the page is a broken light you can click on. Clicking it slowly fades in this image, which looks to be a FNAF office, but none that we've ever seen before. Opening up the source code on this page though shows us one little detail that exposes the entire future of this franchise. The image's title is FNAF underscore Fritz dot PNG. The only other time we have ever seen the name Fritz was on the pink slip from the sixth night of FNAF 2, which was addressed to Fritz Smith, the third and only other night guard we know the name of besides Jeremy and Michael. And just like Jeremy, there isn't just one Fritz. Fritz is a repeated name, one that the Mimic AI will definitely have taken notice of. Move over, Jeremy. You've had your time to shine. But Glitchtrap has a new character he has big plans for. Thank you for watching. It took me weeks to get a script that I liked, so I really hope you enjoyed it. Remember, at the end of the day, theorizing about anything isn't always about being right. It's about enjoying the media you're talking about and sharing ideas. So uh, I hope you enjoyed watching me ramble about it for a while. Again, I highly recommend checking out my other video on this theory. There's plenty of evidence that I don't go over in here. So if you'd like to hear even more insane ramblings from a ginger anime character on the internet, consider subscribing. And a huge thanks to the people in my community and my close friends for your support as I worked on this video. It really means the world to me. I'm looking at you, card 2 Your support is appreciated. I have another video coming down the pipeline very, very soon. All the gameplay footage is gathered and about half the script is written already, and if you follow me on Twitter, you probably already know what it's going to be about. I've decided after making this video that I should probably limit how big in scope I make my projects, so expect more videos that are shorter in the coming weeks. No more trying to solve the entirety of FNAF for me, I need a small break. Or at least I need to make smaller videos that don't cause me to rethink my whole life. I also want to stream more, the last two videos took all my time and attention, so in an effort to have a better balance, I'm going to incorporate Twitch streaming more in my life alongside side video editing. You can hang out when I do that if you'd like over here. Chances are I'll be streaming when this video goes up. Take care of yourself and go buy an ice cream or something. You deserve it. Alright, I think we have a few good takes. Oh, that's f ominous. <laughs> the, the lighting? <laughs> like with your face cover shout? Oh, I hated that.